So, so Nathan, you know, we have people that then relapse after frontline therapy and, you know, to some degree, lack of cure, meaning relapse is kind of the biggest unmet need that we more or less just cited. Um, in your experience, patients are either refractory or relapsed. Kind of how does that um, break out from the standpoint of, you know, there are some patients perhaps more commonly in the double hit group that progress in the middle of their treatment or soon thereafter, but most patients tend to, tend to relapse. How do, you, uh, how do you shake out the relapse setting um, as far as patients that have relapse disease um, and their presentation and the timing of such? So those are very two different populations, John. Uh, patients that are refractory, uh, meaning they're progressing during treatment or soon thereafter, and patients that progress after uh, some interval. And I usually think of that interval as somewhere around 18 months to two years. So in patients that are primary refractory, they often do very poorly regardless of uh, outcome with regards to standard treatment options. And you know that's been seen again and again in different types of trials, patients that are either primary refractory or progressing very early unfortunately, uh, you know, do, do poorly with standard treatment. And so that, that brings up, you know, is this a population that we should be thinking of alternate types of approaches, either some type of cellular therapy or enrollment in the clinical trial? So those are patients that I, I'm really thinking of novel, novel, novel approaches, trial referral, patients that are refractory to their first line of the treatment. Uh, I know that, you know, I've talked to Wyndham Wilson, and he'll tell you patients that are refractory to EPOC in the frontline setting, they, they unfortunately really do, do quite poorly, which is, again, not surprising since we're, it's a pretty aggressive regimen. Now that, 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 in my mind, makes up somewhere around um, you know, maybe 10 to 15 percent of all patients. The, the other 20 percent of patients, maybe 25 percent of patients that relapse, again, assuming that with, with standard frontline therapy, you're going to get long-term remissions in around 60%. Uh, the remainder of, of, again, those patients are patients that are relapsing two to five, six years later. Those patients, uh, you know, I, I generally think of re-exposing to chemotherapy uh, with stem cell transplant as consolidation. Uh, there's lots of data uh, that suggests that those patients actually do well. You know, patients that uh, have a late relapse, uh, you can get into remission and go to transplant. You can probably cure about 50% of those patients that eventually go to transplant. So again, those, those are the two big buckets. I think in general today, even in those early relapses, I will re-expose them to chemotherapy. Uh, but I have to tell you, the, the, the outcomes are much worse than patients that have a, an interval uh, that's significant without disease. Um, how can we identify those patients de novo, that, that's a much more difficult question, right? Are there prognostic markers? Are there genomic findings that can uniformly predict these early relapse patients? I don't think so. I mean, I, we, we talk about double hit, we talk about MIC, there's ABCGC, there's a lot of other um, kind of prognostic systems coming out of multiple places on the East Coast. But even within those systems, uh, there are you know, groups of patients that do well. So we, I think we talk about this all the time. There's double hit patients that do great uh, with CHOP and EPOC. So I don't think that we have a uniform way to identify those patients with biologic markers de novo. And why that matters, right? to me at least, is there a scoring system that tells me I should treat this patient differently in the front line? Uh, to me, no. I mean, and as Cammy mentioned and, and Matt, Double hit is probably the only thing that I that I use routinely to to stratify patients into different treatment, and that would be again something like EPOC. So, Cami, when you see a uh, relapsed DLBCL patient, what are the things that um, come to your mind as to prognosis in that setting and how you're going to approach the patient? Yeah, so the first thing, well, so probably two things. One is, are they primary refractory or has did they get some response to their initial chemotherapy? And then how good a shape are they in? How old are they? What are they going to be a candidate for, for to move forward with treatment with? So the first thing I think at this time um, is a little bit, 
bad outcomes for patients if they're primary refractory, although we don't necessarily have outside of clinical trials any great answer other than giving them more chemotherapy and trying to get them to transplant. Um, there are randomized studies ongoing look at the, the use of cellular therapy with chimeric antigen receptor T cells um, right now, but that's not something that's available in the second line setting. So the biggest decision is if they're a candidate for more aggressive chemotherapy and to try to get them to transplant, or if the patient is not uh, a candidate for more aggressive therapy, either because of their age, their intolerability to RCHOP or our EPOC, um, other medical comorbidities, um, or if the patient is just not interested in that kind of aggressive approach. Uh, so most of the time, whether a patient is a candidate for transplant or not a candidate for transplant, they'll be offered a second line um, chemoimmunotherapy regimen. Uh, we know in patients who are refractory to the first line regimen that they don't respond very well to that chemotherapy. And we also know that even patients who um, respond to the chemotherapy get much less of a response if they have had previous rituximab, which in this era is pretty much going to be every patient. So we're going to get into kind of the run of the mill patient and how we standardly approach them. But I want to ask you, Matt, um, are there any patients where you would retreat with RCHOP or, or give a second line regimen and not transplant them, even if they're a candidate? I've had a couple people recently who've had you know, more or less seven, eight year remissions to our CHOP and have relapsed with large cell lymphoma again. And it crosses my mind, you know, should I just treat them again and not transplant them? Anybody, I mean, assuming they're a candidate for transplant, anybody where you would try to get away with a less aggressive approach? I don't know that I, you know, if, if the intent is curative, I would have uh, difficulty you know, not going down a second line, uh, you know, platinum based uh, regimen uh, and trying to consolidate with an, uh, with an auto transplant. I think you kind of get into those, you know, then you have to go back to the R-CHOP question and, you know, you're looking at doxorubicin with at about what, 300 milligrams per meter squared of cumulative dosing, you know, with six cycles of, of R-CHOP. Um, you know, uh, I can't say I've come across a situation where I've said, I'm going to give you a second uh, time of, of, uh, of RCHOP um, from that standpoint. I think, you know, the, always the unique ones are the localized relapse that have long durability, you know, um, and if people don't want to, you know, take chemotherapy or don't want to go to a transplant, it's like, then are you trying to find some sort of another short course therapy that you could you know, consolidate with radiotherapy. I don't think that that's, you know, necessarily standard, but you, everything, I think everybody on the screen here has always seen those cases that just don't fit the textbooks. Um, and you're trying to figure out, you know, some, some way or some data to explain why, why you didn't go down the, the, you know, the platinum and, and transplant route and what would otherwise be perceived on paper as a person that could go to transplant. Uh, and if they're and if you're in those situations, you're documenting very heavily, you know, what your discussions uh, were and, and, and rationalizing why you chose the course uh, that you went down, because anything short of of that, you know, unless data shows us in the second line CAR T cell setting, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm having a curative intent setting or a, a, curative, a curative intent discussion uh, uh, in that setting. Oh, okay. This, Go ahead, Nathan. Chime in. This um, I'm just wondering, and I, I, John, I think this is a, such a good. Qu is there a patient where you think they could have a second? It's not a relapse. It's a second large cell lymphoma, and uh, for whatever that risk was that led to the initial large cell. And it, again, I, for example, that I just if you had something that was 15 years later, they develop a, a large cell lymphoma in a different site. Is that? Uh, and I, what I'm wondering is, uh, is there a select group of patients that were the relapse is long enough between uh, treatments that it's a new clone? And uh, th this is something I struggle with. I, and um, I think we, we hear about these cases in tumor board. And, and uh, I, I would just say in my, in our setting, I have done this a couple times. I've treated them with CHOP. And if they're, if it matters, as you mentioned, if they're at 300 milligrams per meter squared, I'll do two or three cycles of CHOP and then two or three cycles of CEOP. Yeah. Um, and we've seen a couple, whether that's right or wrong, right? Everything's anecdotal. 
because some of them do well, some of them don't. And uh, but yeah, you really have to you really have to go searching the path reports to call out those. You know, the first one was CD five positive, then that relapsed CD ten positive, and then that kind of asks you, do you spend the money? You know, going after proving that the first and the second clones were different. But but even in those situations, you know that that clone that's arising, you have to think, you know, has seen anthracycline, you know, um, in its in its ontogeny of development of its uh, of the second uh, large cell, um, and so even then, would you re you know re expose them to an anthracycline containing regimen? 